Hey everyone, it's Simon here. Welcome to this month's Learning Lab. Um, today obviously is the 21st of February and the question we're going to try and answer in today's, uh, sorry, coaching call is, are we still in a bear market? Uh, this is absolutely the question I'm being asked most often right now. Uh, and if uh, if there's kind of a dozen people asking it, I, I know from experience, there's probably a few dozen wondering the same thing. So I thought it'd be uh, useful to go through that. Trading is inherently risky. While the potential for rewards exists by trading, you are putting yourself at risk. You must be aware of the risks and be willing to accept them in order to invest or trade in any type of security. Don't trade with money you can't afford to lose. This is neither a solicitation nor an offer to buy or sell securities. These materials are offered for educational purposes only and no investment or trading advice is being given. No representation is being made that any account will or is likely to achieve profits or losses similar to those discussed on this website. And the past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right, let's uh, dive in. Are we still in a bear market? So as I said at the top, this is by far the most common question I'm being asked at the moment. Um, and not just by Options Academy folks, but on social media and, and kind of in, in, in real life as well. Um, now, I just want to drill down into this question a little bit more, and I, I just want you to think about you know, what what does a bear market mean to you? Um, and if you've got any thoughts on this that you, you want to share, please please do so in the Q&A box. Um, but think about what what does bear market mean to you? All right. And and um, if, you, if you've been asking this question of me or of anyone else, what is the how is the answer going to impact you? Um, how how would the way I answer this question impact your thinking or your approach to the market? And and would it be helpful? Okay, would we, if I answered that question a certain way and it did impact your thinking or your approach to the market, would that be helpful? So what is a bear market? So Investopedia says, it's a condition in which securities prices fall 20% or more from recent highs amid widespread pessimism and negative investor sentiment. Fidelity tell us a bear market is a period when investments have fallen at least 20% from recent market highs. The closing price of the S&P 500, an index that tracks the price of 500 large publicly traded US companies, is often used to gauge if the US stock market is in bear market territory. And you will find that this 20% this fall idea is a very common and well-accepted bear market definition. Right? When, when stocks, or when the S&P 500 or a major index declines 20% or more, uh, that's when the press will start rabbiting on about a bear market. Now, I've put a little asterisk here around, whoops, around sentiment, because sentiment can also give us a powerful clue as to the market conditions that we're in. Now you'll find in a bull market, the market will generally be able to step over bad news. All right. If if Tesla recalls 360,000 vehicles and we're in a bull market, stock can close up on a day like that. You know, uh, if we're in a bear market, the stock's probably down 10 or 15%. Um, and what will happen is good news gets all the attention and all of the waiting and bad news. Yeah, I mean, it can have a short-term impact, but the market will tend to step over it. In a bear market, good news is largely goes to waste. You know, companies can announce amazing earnings or amazing acquisitions or deals. And yeah, the stock might be up for a bit, but there's no real celebration. Uh, bad news, on the other hand, gets everyone's attention. People start obsessing over it and, and um, prices will react accordingly. So, Always have, have a regard for whether you're seeing bullish or bearish sentiment in a market. Is good news being paid more attention or, or bad news? And that'll give you an important clue. So are we still in a bear market? Well, the S&P 500 fell 27.5% from its all-time high on the 3rd of January um, to the October low. So that meets the generally accepted definition. Yeah, the S&P was definitely in a bear market last year by any regular definition. The question now is, are we still in a bear market? Because right now the S&P is only 15% from the all-time high. So are we still in a bear market or not? And that's what we'll um, 
that's what we'll, we'll talk about, if, even if we don't try and answer it today. Now, first thing I want to say to you is don't sweat the definitions. Don't sweat the official definitions of bull market and bear market because it, it's all it's all made up anyway. All right? Just because somebody on CNBC or Bloomberg says we're in a bear market, you know, so what? It, it, it doesn't mean it actually doesn't mean anything. So don't worry too much about it. Um, to be honest with you, and I'm not always very good at this, but I, I really do try and avoid using the terms bullish and bearish because of the emotional charge associated with these words, All right? Particularly in my self-talk, I, I really try and avoid saying that I'm bullish or calling myself a bull or calling myself a bear because all sorts of things can happen when you do that, All right? If you, if you convince yourself that we're in a bull market or a bear market, or you convince yourself that you're a bull or you're a bear, you're setting yourself up for reduced mental flexibility. All right. This is because human beings crave consistency. So if you put it out there that you're a bull, even if it's only to yourself or, or a bear, uh, you're likely to become a little bit rigid around that. And um, you're likely to have other problems that result from that mental rigidity. Um, chief among them for a trader is this desire to be right. You've heard the old saying a hundred times, do you want to be right or do you want to make money? Um, that refers to traders who tend to dig their heels in when they're clearly wrong on a trade. They don't want to admit that they're wrong and take the loss. They want to dig their heels in and uh, I'm, I'm right, market's wrong, and I'll, I'll be proven right in the fullness of time. Meanwhile, their account is just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So a good trader admits they're wrong quickly, uh, quickly and early. And, and prevents a small loss from becoming a big loss, all right? Losses are just part of the game. So this desire to be right can really trip you up in trading. In fact, it can it can be the end of you as a trader. And how this manifests is you say, right, I'm a bear. And you hold on to long put positions or short positions in the face of a rising market and you'll say, it doesn't make any sense that the market's rising. We've had crappy earnings. We've got a hawkish Fed. Uh, we've got an inverted yield curve. Uh, ISM was below 50. Uh, it doesn't make any sense that the market's rising. I'm going to hold on to my short positions because I'm right and the market's being irrational. All right. And, and it is that sort of mentality that will blow up your account if, if, you, if you go down that path. But if you've painted yourself as a bear, um, this, you risk setting up this kind of mental inflexibility. Confirmation bias is, is another one. Again, if you've, if you've set yourself up as a bull, you're going to look for evidence that supports your bullish thesis, and you're likely going to ignore evidence that uh, would support a bearish thesis. Same if you're a bear. You're, you're going to obsess about things like the hawkish Fed and the inverted yield curve and ISM and leading indicators, not all of those bearish things that we all know and the market knows about. Uh, and you'll ignore things like um, reacceleration in auto prices, uh, bottoming in housing data, um, very strong labour market statistics. So all all of that you just you'll wave it off as oh it's it's transitory or the data's min manipulated anyway or you know there's any number of excuses. But um, confirmation bias can really creep in when you've convinced yourself that you're in one camp or the other, and all of this can lead to missed opportunities. All right. If you're so convinced that you're a bear and markets should only be going to hell in a handbasket from here, you're going to miss out on all of the good bullish trades that are right in front of you and, and setting up. You, you may not even be scanning for them, even though the market's in an uptrend because, no, I'm a bear. Markets shouldn't be rallying. They should be falling because of this, 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 and this. And that's really dangerous as a trader, not only because you miss opportunities, but because you can make decisions based off what you think are happening, what you think should happen, rather than what is actually happening in price. And price is the truth. And so the crux of all of that is it leads to poor risk management, all right? This desire to be right, this confirmation bias can lead you to hold on to losing positions because you believe that those positions are right and the market is wrong, the market's stupid, it's just dumb retail pumping the market, the market's rigged, whatever. You've probably heard all of those excuses. I know I have. 
Um, but if you're using those excuses to hold on to losing positions, it's probably as a result of you um, putting yourself in a situation of where you're suffering from mental rigidity. Uh, and, and as traders, we've always got to be flexible, very, very mentally flexible. Um, now, in real life, it's it's really good to have strong conviction in your beliefs and, and what you stand up, up for and you know your morals and you have that integrity and, and and this can be a large part of what leads to success in real life and in business and, and people kind of respecting you as somebody who stands up for your word and that sort of thing all right but in trading um it, you're setting yourself self up for a hiding all right and it's one of the very important ways where trading and real life are very very different So the better approach, uh, if somebody says to me, so Simon, are you bullish or bearish? My typical response would be, I'm a trader, so therefore I'm neither. All right, I'm just looking for opportunities. I'm not a bull, I'm not a bear. I'm just somebody who is happy to trade the market in any direction. So instead of thinking in terms of bullish or bearish, I prefer to think in terms of the path of least resistance. Um, so, Simon, are you bullish on the S&P 500? I, I, I would, again, I try and avoid using the word bullish because it has an emotional charge to it. What I would say is, look, I think the path of least resistance is higher from here. Now, this path can change very, very quickly as new evidence comes to hand, all right? All, all I'm doing is changing an opinion based on evidence, which is much easier than changing a belief. And when you start saying I'm bullish or I'm bear, I'm, I'm a bull, I'm a bear, that starts to that start that can start to become a belief rather than just a an opinion based on evidence. So I'm not going to tell anyone, I'm not going to tell myself or anyone else that I'm a bull or that I'm a bear, and then only seek evidence that confirms my belief. All right. I want to be open to all new evidence that comes to hand. Uh, and I'm going to share a truckload of evidence with you today that is quite conflicting with how I've been feeling about the markets up until very recently. All right. So hopefully I can uh, share with you um, some ways in which I've found to be mentally flexible. Um, and, and you can sort of borrow that, copy that, learn from it, make it your own, adapt it to your own, um, your own uh, way of thinking. The key is, as a trader, I'm going to remain open-minded to all possibilities and assess all new evidence as it comes to mind. I'm not only going to look for evidence that supports my bullish view because I'm a bull. I'm not only going to look for evidence that supports my bearish thesis because I'm a bear. All right. It's really about just being open-minded and going with the flow, treating price, price as truth, but also watching for early warning signs. You know, the, okay, the markets look bullish here, but are there any problems I need to be aware of? And, and that's, the, that's the, the bigger discussion we're going to have today. So how do we determine the path of least resistance? Well, you, all of you already know this better than 99% of market participants. We focus on the prevailing dominant trend. We look for things like rainbow logic. We look at the momentum bars, the ADX, the DMI. We, we look for multiple time frame analysis, all of those tools that you've hopefully learned by now or, or, or on your way to learning are how we folk, how we determine that path of least resistance. Now, let me just give you a little refresher over the next few minutes. Uh, we're going to recap on the 200 days simple moving average because this can provide really important clues about market behavior. And a uh, great quote here from Paul Tudor Jones, my metric for everything I look at is the 200 day moving average of closing prices. I've seen too many things go to zero, stocks and commodities. The whole trick in investing is how do I keep from losing everything? If you use the 200 day moving average rule, then you get out, you play defense and you get out. All right. So if guys like Paul Tudor Jones are looking at the 200 day moving average, you know, we all should be. Okay. It's as simple as that. So I call the 200-day moving average the, the Jekyll and Hyde switch. Now, the 200-day simple moving average, it's widely viewed as the line in the sand between a long-term uptrend and a long-term downtrend. So if you like, you, you could see this as the dividing line between a bull market and a bear market. Certainly, 
a market that is trading above its 200-day moving average is going to have more bull market characteristics. A market that's trading below its 200-day moving average is going to have more bear market characteristics. And we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. The key thing here, though, is that the 200-day moving average gets a lot of attention. Uh, basically, everybody is looking at it or aware of it. You know, we're, we're talking about retail traders. We're talking about do-it-yourself investors. We're talking about hedge fund managers. We're talking about portfolio managers. We're talking about pension fund managers. All right, everybody looks at this, and stocks that are trading at the 200-day moving average have got something of a spotlight being shined on them. Now, markets that are trading above their 200-day moving average tend to be slower, gentler, buy every dip kind of markets. All right, this is this, these are the markets we we love to trade because they are easier. Uh, counter trend moves are smaller, um, and and really you just you just buy every dip, uh, and it and it works and it works and it works until it doesn't work. And, you know, the stock will top and then it will go through a little downtrend or have a squirrely correction. Um, but you generally find you, your win rate in a bull market is going to be higher than your win rate in a bear market because bear markets have more two-way movement. Now, when a symbol crosses below its 200-day moving average, it is as if it undergoes a personality shift. And I, I you know, I sort of made a reference to the, the Jacqueline and Hyde switch earlier. Uh, and that's that's kind of what it's like. And when you see a stock trading under, or when you see a stock market trading under its 200-day simple moving average. Um, they have a faster feel to them. They, they definitely feel scarier. Um, the news headlines generally suck, uh, and bad things just seem to keep seem to keep happening. CNBC is running uh, regular markets and turmoil segments. Uh, a key here is that bear market rallies can be ferocious, and they can be big enough to convince almost everyone that the bear market is over. That might be what we're looking at right at the moment. But for sure, markets are easiest to trade when they're happy or bored, all right? And a market that is below its 200-day moving average is neither of those things. Uh, Mo, we are comparing the price of the asset to the 200-day moving average. We're not talking about moving, moving average crossovers here at all, just looking at where price is in relation to the 200-day moving average. So this is a chart of the NASDAQ currently. And the observations I want to highlight to you here, are when it's above the 200-day moving average, there's strong upward bias to the moves. And the pullbacks, I mean, that that's a big one, right? But mo most of these pullbacks are really, really, really small. You can imagine little pullbacks to the ATMA. If I drew it on there, that one's probably back to the 34 EMA, maybe even the 50 SMA. But most of these pullbacks are just really, really small and well measured. And there's a strong upward pull. Now, when price moves, like almost as soon as it crosses below the 200 day moving average, but the key is when the 200 day moving average starts pointing downward volatility really starts to pick up. There's a strong downward pull. But not only that, there's a lot more two-way movement. I mean, look at the size of that rally. Look at the size of that rally. Now, this was a big rally. Basically, you go from a market that's sort of doing this to a market that's kind of doing this, all right? It's a slight exaggeration. But this is the sort of personality shift that you get when you're above the 200 versus below the 200. works on single stocks as well. So here's a chart of Amazon and you can see when it's above the 200. I mean this is a this is a pretty kind of boring sideways choppy pattern. But you can see it's it's, it's just in a fairly narrow range. But then as soon as we we like we break the 200 day moving average and then as soon as it starts pointing down and prices below it we start getting massive swings. Big big drawdowns to the downside. But also monster rallies, you know, with big gaps in them as well. And it, we, we're just seeing a lot of two-way volatility. All right, it really looks like, um, you know, the, we we get down here and the patient's off its meds. All right, it, it's uh, it's kind of behaving in a more psychotic manner. Whereas here, I mean, it, that's that's an ugly chart, but you can see that the volatility is certainly a lot lower. 
If we look at the S and P five hundred. So this is um, this is twenty twenty. Okay, this is the COVID crash, and you can see here we've got generally fairly polite little pullbacks. We had a little little dip below the two hundred there, but generally speaking, it's a fairly well behaved market. And then as soon as price gets below the 200, boom, and it hits a vacuum. And we get a massive acceleration to the downside and then another massive rally. Now, remember, massive rallies are a part of being below the 200 as well. If, 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 a, if, if all the bear market did was that, it'd be really easy tr to trade. You sell the rip, sell the rip, sell the rip. The problem is bear markets tend to do this. You know, I'm, I'm again, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of two way movement, a lot of big, big rallies. And then, so we got this big V shaped recovery. That was obviously as a result of just an unprecedented amount of stimulus that was dumped into the economy in a very short space of time. But as soon as the market gets back above the 200, oh, it's, it's back on its meds, you know, and it starts kind of behaving a lot more politely. And of course, 2021 was just a, a year where I think the biggest pullback all year was like 5.6%. Now that in itself was unusual. Um, this is the 200 day simple moving average on the S&P 500 from 2005 to 2009. So this takes into account the global financial crisis. And again, what you can see is when the price is above the 200, just small little price movements, very orderly. Yeah, we get a couple of squirrely little pullbacks to just below the 200, but we break the 200, things start getting a bit noisy. As soon as the 200 starts pointing down, oh my goodness, you know, massive draws to the downside, big vacuum, a lot of volatility, and uh, again, very characteristic of uh, a market that's trading below its 200 day moving average. So when we get below the 200 and it starts pointing down, that's when you can really expect a wild ride. That's when the VIX kind of now, in this environment, the VIX spikes at 20. Here, the VIX barely ever trades back down to 20. All right, that's, that's another way of thinking about the increase in volatility that we're seeing. So let's talk about a market update now and, and where, where, we're, where we're at today. Um, the major equity indices look almost unambiguously bullish. And we'll, we'll go through and look at those in a few minutes. The macro situation, however, is not necessarily agreeing with the bullishness that we're seeing in equities. Um, now, a, an important maxim as a trader is to trade the chart in front of you, all right, because price is truth, but being aware of potential changes of the direction of the prevailing winds is also important. So let's dive in and uh, I'll move to some charts. So let's jump into Think or Swim here. So looking at the S&P 500, the daily chart, what is there to like about this chart? Well, honestly, there's quite a lot to like. All right. We have got bullish rainbow logic. Okay. Red, orange, yellow, green, and then purple. And I don't worry about the 100 simple moving average. That doesn't sort of form part of the, the rainbow logic. But we, we've got bullish rainbow logic. All of the short-term moving averages are stacked in a rainbow fashion. We've got green momentum bars. We've got an uptrend. We've got a low, a high, higher low, higher high, higher low, higher high. All right. And the S&P's ability to take out that high is, is significant, all right? It, it means that we are in a continued uptrend until until proven otherwise. What happened on Friday, we got a pullback to the 21 EMA and we closed above it just. Uh, but so far, that is looking like a pretty orderly reversion to the mean. So look at the daily chart in the S&P. There's no problems. There's no problems on this chart, technically, if, if you're bullish, all right? And, and you would look at that chart and say, yeah, you know, we've had a pullback to the mean. Let's wait for a close. Let's wait for a low bar and a close above the high of the low bar. And potentially, you know, we get a bounce trade in SPY and yeah, we, we should make higher highs. All, all looks good. Let's zoom out to a weekly chart, see what that's telling us. Now, the weekly chart here is 
also pretty bullish. So we had a pretty big fall. This was 27.5% fall. That was a pretty serious bear market in 2022. But have a look where we bottomed. We bottomed at the 200-week moving average, but also at the 50% retracement level from the COVID low to the all-time high. So if the market was going to find a bottom, this is a heck of a place to do it. All right. Weekly 200 moving average, 50% retracement, big level. We've also broken out of these downtrend lines here and here. We've got a breakout here. Now, I always like to see two consecutive bars to confirm a breakout. We've now got one, two, three, four consecutive bars closing above this upper trend line. And this whole bear market on the weekly chart, and especially if we zoom out to a monthly chart, it's it's just starting to look like a bull flag, isn't it? It, it looks like a, a consolidation within a longer term uptrend. All right. So the weekly chart here is looking bullish. We've also got one, two, three, four consecutive closes above the 50 week moving average. All right. 200 week moving average is still moving up. 50 week moving average is pointing down, but it's starting to curl back up. So daily chart, weekly chart, SPY, S&P 500 ETF, both looking bullish. Let's have a look at the triple Qs, the NASDAQ ETF. So this one here, well, actually, there's something else I wanted to show you. Um, let's go back to SPY. Well, I've got an SPX, which is the cash index, just so I don't get all my FIB lines confused. But if we go to a weekly chart here, and we just draw some FIBs on here, the all-time high to the bear market low, have a look at where we got to. We got to the 50% retracement. And if we zoom out, this is a level price has respected in the past. All right. And there it was again. So if we just have a look at the confluence of factors here, we got to three ATRs above the mean. Well, there's three ATRs above the mean. We, we, were, we, we were basically there and the 50% retracement. All right. So you could have expected the market to start to struggle a little bit here. Now, whether this is just a little bull flag in, in a shorter term uptrend, or whether this pullback becomes something more remains to be seen. And I think this week could be fairly telling um, for, for, for reasons that I'm going, to, I'm going to share with you over the next few minutes. All right, but that was just something else I wanted to share with you on S&P before we go to the Qs, which is of course the NASDAQ ETF. So the NASDAQ ETF has failed at a very, very similar spot. And that, that was what reminded me. So we're not, we're not at the 50% retracement level from the all-time high, but we're 50%, we're up to the 50% retracement from this significant swing high from April. I just need to uh, redraw that slightly. Uh, there. So just wicked the 50% retracement. Now, again, this is a level prices respected in the past. It's funny how this Fibonacci stuff works, isn't it? Because you think about it, when, when this was acting as resistance, the market had no idea that that was going to be the ultimate swing low. And yet the 50% level, even though it didn't exist back then, was already, being, was already acting as support and resistance. So three ATRs above the mean, 50% retracement from a major swing high. Uh, again, you, you could have absolutely expected the NASDAQ would at the very least pause at this level. But so far, it hasn't, it's not showing signs of failure. What we've done is we pull back the 21 EMA. We've just wicked it. All right. We've got green momentum bars. We've got bullish rainbow logic. So all of that is looking good. No problems at all on the daily chart. Let's zoom out to the weekly chart. And the weekly chart looks pretty good as well. Now, the low isn't as clear cut as on the S&P 500. It, obviously, we've got a pretty serious penetration of the 200-week moving average here. But what's happened since then, we've broken out of this downtrend line. We've got one, two, three, four consecutive closes. Actually, this week hasn't closed, so let, let's call it three. But three is enough. Three consecutive closes above that downtrend line. We've got two 
uh, we got one. Let me just, okay, I'm going to be very precise here. So that week, we closed at 299.7. And the 50 was 299.31. So that is, technically speaking, two consecutive closes above the 50-week simple moving average. All right, so that looks bullish. The other thing here that we don't have on the S&P, but we do on the NASDAQ, is a weekly squeeze that has just fired long. We're only two bars in. So we could have another six, six, even eight weeks of bullish tailwind for the NASDAQ if this squeeze runs its course. Remember, a squeeze will often have eight to 10 bars of momentum with it. And on a weekly chart, that's eight to 10 weeks. So even if we get eight weeks, there's potentially another six weeks of bullish tailwind uh, as this squeeze, weekly squeeze develops, which could see the triple keys trade all the way up to 337, which would be three ATRs above the mean. Now, I'm not saying that it's definitely going to happen, but it's something to be open-minded to, even if you're feeling really bearish and like the market doesn't make any sense and it's stupid how all these tech companies are running when uh, interest rates are rising. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but price is the ultimate truth. And, and if, this, if that's what the technicals are telling us, uh, it pays to be open-minded to it. So look at the NASDAQ. Yeah, I mean, it, you trade the chart in front of you, it's bullish. You, you want to be long. Let's have a look at the Dow. DIA is the ETF that tracks the Dow, Dow Jones. Now, this thing has just done nothing. All right, it's traded sideways for four months. It's traded within a 7% range for the last four months, which is pretty crazy when you think about the volatility that we had last year. Um, not surprisingly, we were in a daily squeeze. We had a two-day squeeze, a three-day squeeze, a monthly squeeze. Monthly squeeze here could be fun, couldn't it? Um, now, momentum is negative, but it is rolling higher. Imagine if the monthly squeeze on the Dow fired long. I, that that would really annoy a lot of people. I can tell you. All right, that that would be that would that would be quite a lot of fun. So, so something to keep an eye on there. Um, but really, it's 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 not super bullish. But there's nothing wrong with this chart. Uh, and if you wanted to play the squeeze, uh, you'd, you'd probably play it from the long side rather than the short side here, given. Um, You know, we've got rainbow logic on the daily and weekly charts. Uh, momentum is positive. All right. So the Dow, it's not, it's not, it's not a beautiful looking chart. I, I wouldn't trade that, but I'd, I'd rather be a buyer than a seller of it here. Let's have a look at IWM, which is the, the Russell 2000 ETF, tracks the small caps. And again, we've got rainbow logic. Uh, we've got a market that is, have a look at this price action. Every dip to the 21 EMA is being bought. Every single dip to the 21 EMA is being bought. It's just hugging that 21 EMA. Momentum bars are green. We've got bullish rainbow logic. Um, you know, all of that looks good. So that there's really no problems on the IWM chart at all if you're bullish. And arguably, you know, you can get good entry nice and close to the mean and we should make high highs and all the rest of it. So... There's, there's a lot to like looking at the individual equity indices. Now, a couple of other things to share with you is breadth. Okay, so this is a chart of the S&P 500 with the advanced decline line. So the advanced decline line is a measure of market breadth. It measures on each day the num number of rising issues um, versus the number of falling issues. Uh, advancing issues versus declining issues. If the number of advancing issues is greater than the number of declining issues, it gets added to the previous day's number and the line will go up. If the number of declining issues is greater than the number of, of advancing issues, it gets subtracted from the previous day's number and the line will go down. Now, when you see significant divergences from the advanced decline line and price, that can be a, a really good warning of, of what's about to happen. And if we have a look back in November to January, November 2021 to January 2022, you can see the advanced decline line made a high here, and it made a lower high here, and it made a low here, and it made a lower low here. Now, what did the S&P do? S&P made a high here, and then it made a higher high, and it made a low here, and then it made a higher low. All right, so that's a divergence. And what happened? Well, this divergence in the advanced decline line is really 
it, it was an early heads up that this rally was about to fail or, or was stale at least and we were due for a pullback and that's exactly what happened now if you have a look at what's going on here yes the advanced decline line and the s p moving very much together which is what normally happens but here the advanced decline line has shot higher all right and the s p hasn't now when this when i first noticed this it was it was kind of back here let me just um it was, it was sort of back here i'd noticed that the advanced decline line had surged higher and that price hadn't okay the advanced decline line had made a new high price hadn't made a new high and that's when i said right we, we have very high chance to take out this high which is obviously what happened a few days later looking at the advanced decline line i would not be surprised at all if the s p takes out this high or at least comes up and challenges it so if the s p comes up and challenges 430 that would not surprise me based on how strong market breadth has been and what a powerful indicator this advanced decline line can be when you see divergences if you want to plot this on your charts, you just go to uh, indicators and search up ADL in, in trading view. And here it is, advanced decline line. And you can just plot it. And then you just kind of just drag that onto, onto your main chart. So I'm uh, just showing you how to get it on your chart there. So that's, that's one way of looking at breadth. There are a couple of other ways. Um, this here is showing the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 excuse me, that are trading above their 200-day moving, 50-day uh, moving average. So, two, oh, sorry, 200-day moving average. So fully two-thirds of stocks are trading above their 200-day moving average. That is exactly what you want to see in a, in, a, in a rising market, in a, dare I say it, bull market. That's, that is healthy. If this number was less than 50%, that would show you that there's a, there's a lack of breadth in the rally. We're not seeing a lack of breadth. If we look at the NASDAQ, same story, two thirds of stocks trading above their 200 day moving average. That's exactly what you want to see. It's not a ridiculously overbought number, it's just a good solid number. 70% uh, of NASDAQ stocks are above their 50 day moving average. So, 50 day moving average is your medium term uptrend. That means nearly three quarters of stocks now are in a medium term uptrend. So, all of that is, is very bullish for breadth. All right. It's not what bears want to hear. And it, it might jar with what you think should be happening, uh, but it's what it's what has happened. All right, th th these are all facts, not opinions. All right, so I've just got a couple of questions here. Let me jump in onto them first. Uh, Guru Dev, you're just pointing out when it broke uh, 50%, it found support at the 61.8. You're talking about the SPX? Oh yeah, so when it broke fifty here, uh, the sixty one point eight was was a really key resistance level, and that's another reason why I think forty three hundred is is a good target for the S and P. Um, not only is that sort of highlighted by the advanced decline line, uh, but it's a good target for the fib rate ratios and uh, previous swing high as well. Uh, Guru Dev, you're asking, do I prefer to trade the DIA directly as an ETF or look for stocks within the DIA? Either and both. Uh, I've traded, traded the D DIA several times, uh, but I also like to trade, you know, Boeing and Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and you know, all of those great stocks as well. So, uh, yeah, very open-minded about, about vehicles to trade. Uh, all of the Dow stocks tend to be pretty good liquid option stocks to trade. Uh, my, what I mean by issues, issues, I mean problems, all right, uh, potential problems, all right. So what, what I've painted to you so far is a, is a very bullish argument, I think you'll agree. All right, what, what I'm now going to do is, is tell you why I am extremely reticent to load the boat on long positions, um, because I, I think that there are some problems developing in, in the macro situation, in, in the peripheral markets that, uh, that we also analyze. In conjunction with the, uh, the the major indices, you're welcome, Gurudev. So let's begin with the bonds. And what I'll share with you now is a chart of the Nasdaq versus TLT. So these are just a couple of ETFs. 
NASDAQ tracks, uh, triple Q tracks the NASDAQ, TLT tracks the longer end of the treasury bond market. Now, what I want you to notice on this chart is what happens when we get a divergence between the NASDAQ and the bonds. So when the NASDAQ rallies and bonds fall, what ends up happening? Well, the NASDAQ ends up playing catch up, right? And it starts falling. Maybe I'll go back to my pink color pen. So again, here we've, we've got the NASDAQ surging higher and we've got bonds falling. And what ended up happening? Well, the NASDAQ ended up playing catch up and we had a pretty big sell off. And then again, here we had the NASDAQ rallying while bonds were selling off. Again, that didn't last very long. The NASDAQ soon started playing catch up and we had another pretty big sell off. Now, what do we got here? We've got the NASDAQ rallying while bonds are selling off. The question remains. Will the NASDAQ follow suit and have a big sell off and play catch up to the decline we've already seen in bonds? Now, I've got to point out to you that stocks and bonds don't always have a perfect one for one correlation. All right. In fact, it's, it's usually not the case. Uh, this is why there is such a thing as the 60 40 portfolio, uh, because bonds usually provide some diversification to stocks. Uh, usually if stocks are falling, bonds will rally. Um, in an inflationary recession, though, that doesn't work because when you've got inflation, people are just as likely to sell bonds as they are stocks. So, uh, you know, this, infl this, this correlation won't hold together forever. But for as long as inflation is seen to be a problem or a threat or an issue, uh, I, I would expect this correlation will, will continue. And what I always say to people is when you see a correlation like this, assume it's going to continue until it doesn't. It's a bit like a trend. You want to assume a trend will continue until it doesn't, and until proven otherwise. Um, so I'm going to assume that unless we see this sell-off in bonds arrest like this week, uh, the NASDAQ is probably setting itself up for a sell-off. So let's have a look at the bonds. What we're going to look at first of all is ZB which is the 10 year treasury 30 uh, year treasury bond futures now i'll just zoom in a little bit here what we've got is price is below a declining 200 day moving average it's below a declining 50 day moving average we've got bearish rainbow logic so all of that is is pointing to path of least resistance being lower we've also had a squeeze here which is fired short now that squeeze could be about to run out of momentum and, and just have a look at the price level we're at where that squeeze could be about to run out of momentum. You see it? Again, it's a level that price has respected in the past. Support, congestion, resistance, support, support, potentially, right? So I think that this is a really big week for the bonds. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I think is going to have to happen, well, not have to happen, but what, what I'm looking for is if bonds get crunched lower here, I think NASDAQ is in trouble. And, and I think the whole stock market is in trouble. Um, you know, we, we could get a pretty decent pullback if that happens. If, however, bonds can kind of hold, get their act together here and, and start to rally, I think that signals the all clear for the NASDAQ to have the next leg, leg higher. And, and that's where we'll see, uh, we, we've seen a pullback to the 21 EMA. That's where I think we'll see a rally from the 21 EMA. Now, so that's ZB, long bonds. Let's have a look at ZN, which is the 10 year notes. This chart is potentially even slightly more interesting. So again, here, we're at a pretty key level. So resistance, support, support, oops, broken support. Now, don't get too excited about this potential break of support because what happens these days in markets is these things can be done on purpose all right so everybody gets not everybody but you know traders look at this they see oh price is broken down let's short bonds they pile on a bunch of short trades because they're trading the breakdown below support 
And then what can often happen is it'll bounce and that will cause all the people who shorted the breakdown to have to cover. And that's when you get a short covering rally. All right. So I, I call it the oops pattern. Um, and it, you know, th these things can be done obviously quite deliberately. It remains to be seen whether that's going to happen. But I think ZN and ZB are both at very critical points right now. And I think with ZN, it's even more critical because we've already had a, a tentative break of this support level. And if ZN continues to crunch lower, uh, NASDAQ will follow it down, I, I believe. If, if, however, we get some short covering and ZN recovers, again, I believe that will signal the all clear for the NASDAQ to, to rally from this reversion to the mean. All right, so bonds, really important market to watch. We've got FOMC minutes out today. Um, FOMC minutes is one of those things that, you know, we, we all know what the Fed said last FOMC meeting, but the markets still tend to obsess over them. And if there's messages in there that the market now chooses to interpret as bearish or hawkish, whereas last month it was all bullish and, and very dovish, you know, that, that could be enough to inspire a sell-off. So in, very, very interesting to watch the reaction, more so in bonds than in equities, I think, because uh, they will typically lead. Uh, it's very rare to see the equity market leading the bond market. Um, bond markets generally get this right far more often. Now, let's have a look at the dollar. The dollar really has been in the driver's seat uh, over the past year plus. A rising dollar is a headwind for stocks. And we had a rising dollar you know, throughout the whole of 2022. And that was obviously a big headwind. And then the dollar peaked in uh, September. And the stock market bottomed in October. And it's not, we haven't been in a big bull market, but the stock, the, the dollar has stopped being a headwind. All right. And in fact, it's even been more of a tailwind. And of course, the SP is up 7% this month. The NASDAQ's up, what, nearly 15 or about 15% this month. So this, this decline in the dollar has gone from, well, the, the rising dollar was a headwind. The declining dollar has been a tailwind. Now, what are we looking at here? Well, the 8 EMA is crossed above the 21 EMA and the 34 EMA and the 50 SMA. Price has crossed up above the 50 SMA. We've got one, two, three, four consecutive closes above the 50. So it looks like the dollar here is trying to turn things around and form a bottom. Now, I don't like to look at the dollar chart in isolation. It's also helpful to look at some of the crosses. So euro is by far the biggest component of the dollar index. So if you look at Euro USD, um, you can see it looks like a mirror image. In fact, if we just invert this, you can do this in Think or Swim. You just put a minus sign in front of it. That pretty much looks like a chart of DXY, doesn't it? Just remember what that chart looks like. DXY. So almost exactly the same, right? And that's because Euro is it's like 50% of DXY. So what we've got here is uh, price has broken the 50 the, the ATMA has crossed the key moving averages. The moving averages here, are they're, they're jumbled, but price is below all of the key ones. Uh, however, we had a squeeze fire short and there was very little momentum. Remember when a squeeze fires, you often get to three ATRs above or below the mean. So if the squeeze fires short, probability suggests you get to three ATRs below the mean. Didn't get anywhere near that. So it's been a very, very tentative sell-off. Now, if Euro kind of catches his breath here and starts rallying, guess what? That is going to mean dollar weakness. Euro strength means dollar weakness. All right. So keep an eye on Euro dollar as well, because if DXY starts falling, it becomes a tailwind again. Now, these are all big ifs, and uh, it, it is looking like the dollar has put in a fairly important bottom here. But keep an eye on euro. Um, dollar yen is the second biggest component, and here we don't have to invert it because it's it's dollars dollars. If this chart's going up, it's dollar strength. Here we've had a squeeze fire long, and and we have actually had some follow through. All right, we're not three ATRs above the mean yet, but we at least we did have a bit of a price surge. This chart still looks bullish. Momentum bars have just turned green, um, so it looks like uh, dollar yen strength will contribute to dollar strength or DXY strength. So dollar, also another really important chart. And if it has put in a bottom and is, uh, is, is about to stage a big rally, uh, that'll be a headwind for stocks. Now, 
don't fall into the trap of thinking if the dollar is up today, stocks will be down today. It doesn't work like that. But if the dollar is going to rally back up to 115, it's going to be very hard for the S&P to rally up to 4,300. All right. It's, it's going to be a real headwind. So keep a close eye on dollar. Let's check out HYG credit markets. So I like to look at credit markets because credit markets are much better at sniffing out danger and problems than equity markets. And HYG is the ETF barometer of the most kind of sensitive spectrum of the credit markets, and that's junk yield, junk bonds, high yield bonds. Now, what you'll see on this chart is a complete breakdown, complete technical breakdown. Prices sliced through the 50-day moving average, the 200-day moving average. Um, it's found support tentatively here at the 100-period simple moving average. We've had a squeeze fire short. All of this is no bueno for SPY. All right, you can see how up until this point, both those charts were looking pretty similar. What's happened with HYG is we've just had a, a monumental breakdown. Just did, The trend structure just got destroyed in a very short space of time. All right, so this is a big warning. All right, we, we want to see SPY and HYG moving together. Uh, this is a divergence. You ignore at your peril, in my opinion, um, because credit markets, like I said, they are much better at sniffing out problems than equity markets. The other key warning sign I want to share with you is the put call ratio. So I'll just bring that chart up quickly. So this is, hopefully you all remember it from the, uh, the how to hedge module. Now the put call ratio is something I've been following really since, since 2008, since the global financial crisis. And barring a period of 15 odd months uh, towards the end of 2020 and through 2021, it, 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 it just has never failed me. Now, there was a period where the put-call ratio went really wonky when we had that sort of explosion in retail options trading and meme stocks and GameStop and all of that. Um, but, but really, since the beginning of 2022, it seems to have gone back to normal. Now, back to normal is this. I'll just give you a quick refresher. When the put-call ratio is below 0 0.8, all right, below 0 0.8, this is a sign that everybody's long. Uh, far more puts have been bought relative to calls. And it's actually the, it's the 10-day moving average I'm looking at, which is this white line. So below 0.8, everybody's long. And when everybody's long, guess what? The market runs out of buyers, and that's when a top gets put in. And if you have a look at what's happened, whoops, let me just uh, delete that. So back here, we got below 0.8 coincided with that top. Uh, we were below 0.8 for an extended period here, but it coincided nicely with that top and yet another another crack there. We were below 0.8 here, coincided with that top. We got below 0.8 here, coincided nicely with that top. And we're below 0.8 right now. And so that is screaming to me, I'm a top, I'm a top. Now, on the other side of the equation, when the put call ratio gets above one, that means everybody's wet the bed, okay? Everybody's rushed out, they've got super bearish, and they've all bought puts, and, and that is when the market will, will find a bottom. When everyone's bearish, and everyone's hedged, and everyone's rushed out and bought puts, that is when you get floor in the market, all right? And as bearish as everyone was back here, at the end of December, I saw the put call ratio, and you might remember me saying, this is a really good sign that the market's going to put in a low. All right, the very high chance we're not going to keep selling off. And, and of course, that's exactly what happened. All right, so the put call ratio, it's one of my favorite market internals. It's just, it's something I've watched for many, many years. And, and despite that 15 odd month period where options markets got a bit wonky, it's just never failed me. So it's a, again, it's, a, it's something that I think you ignore at your peril. Um, and the fact is we've just had a sell signal from it. All right. That, that is something to be very cautious about. So in summary, the charts of the major indices look really, really bullish market breadth looks really, really bullish. 
all of that is what we want to see in a market that is making progress to the upside. But there are some issues, some potential problems that we need to be aware of. The put call ratio is certainly one. HYG is certainly another one. The dollar, it's not a problem per se, but we need to be aware of it because if this advance continues, it's going to be a headwind. And I think the key thing for this week, or, or you know, maybe this week and next, is, is the bonds and, and what happens on ZB and ZN. 30-year bonds and 10-year bonds, if they keep getting crunched, I think we're going to see a, a pretty hefty pullback in the NASDAQ. If they can turn around and we see some short covering and a rally, I think the NASDAQ is all clear to make the next the next target. All right. So that was everything that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, really happy to open it up to any questions you may have. Uh, Guru Dev, you're asking about whether the Fed is still buying high yield bonds. Um, they, to my knowledge, they didn't actually buy any, but but what they did was they um, they put it in their remit. They, they they expanded their remit to ha have the ability to do so, and and that was enough at the time to to buy the market. Um, but I, I I think that those uh, emergency measures have, have sort of been repealed now, and, and certainly credit spreads are tight. Yeah, you know, the, the, the credit spreads are not um not really flashing any major warnings. It's just that there is a divergence between HYG and SPY at the moment. I mean, high yield credit spreads are not saying, you know, there's a credit event coming. But but this divergence is an early warning sign, and it's something that forms part of the matrix of what I analyze. Uh, and when I see that, align with bonds, align with the dollar, align with the put call ratio, when I look at those peripheral markets and, and indicators, um, that forms part of my macro analysis, I, I see plenty of reasons for an abundance of caution here, even though the major ind indices look really bullish. And, and you're asking, uh, what are my thoughts on the big flip? Um, is inflation likely to reaccelerate? Yeah, look, I, I think the the probabilities are inflation is likely to reaccelerate here. I, I don't think inflation uh, has been contained. You know, for, for all of the the cheerleading around the the peak of inflation, I, I've said this many many times. Just because inflation has peaked doesn't mean it's gone away. Um, and even if we don't exceed, you know, nine percent CPI again. Uh, even if it reaccelerates to seven seven and a half percent, that that is still problematic, uh, and that is that is a level of inflation that a five percent terminal rate is unlikely to um, deal with. All right, so yeah, I, I think the I think the risk is we we just see you know the inflation genie continue out of the bottle. We continue to see very tight labour markets, uh, and we continue to see a Fed that is just forced to, to ratchet up the terminal rate. Uh, and that is something that equity markets right now seem to be um, kind of blissfully unaware of or, or just 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 don't care about or don't believe. Um, the, the equity market really since the, the Fed started hiking hasn't believed that the Fed would do what they said they were going to do. Um, and, and that still seems to be the case. Uh, the, the equity market still seems to be calling uh, the Fed and Powell's bluff. And um, didn't work out so well last year. I, I, I'm not convinced it's going to work out any better this year. Here, Dev, you're looking at um, HPE and HCA. Let's have a look. Let's check those out. Okay, so Hewlett Packard here. Um, we've got we've got a daily squeeze. Uh, we've got Rainbow Logic price has pulled back to the mean, so we've got good entry. We've got earnings coming up soon. Uh, that's on the second of March, so you would want to just check that this is a stock that runs into earnings. But I would say, on the face of it, you know, technically that looks pretty good. 
Um, we've got two day, three day weekly squeezes. Okay, so here's a potential problem. We've gone into a two day squeeze. We've gone into a three day squeeze as well. Um, what can happen if you're in a three day squeeze is price can stay sideways for a bit longer, you know, for, for a few more days. And, and what can happen is price just goes to sleep between now and earnings. And it is actually the earnings event that causes that squeeze to fire one direction or the other. So my, my question mark over this trade would be, yeah, I, I like the technicals, but we've got earnings coming up and we've got one day, two day, three day squeezes with earnings not far away. You might find the stock is just squeezing and just meandering sideways between now and earnings. So that, that, that would be the risk. Um, but if it wasn't for earnings, I'd say, yeah, it's a, it, it technically looks pretty good here. Uh, let's have a look at HCA. Yeah, HCA looks looks really good as well. Um, we've got obviously a nice squeeze, very, very nice uptrend. Uh, price is a little bit extended away from the mean. I'd, I'd love to try and buy it and a pullback to you know, 257, um, but momentum is, is above zero and shifting higher. That all looks good if we drop down. So we've got, um, yeah, re really the daily squeeze is, is, the main, is the main play there. But uh, yeah, I, I would have to say that that, that is a, a pretty good looking chart. I would just, I, I would try and finish an entry closer to the mean though. Um, and be, be aware, HCA, it can be uh, a little less liquid in the options market. The spreads can be a little wide there. Open interest can be a little thin. Um, so you, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to be trading uh, significant size on that one. Oh, just on that, that reminds me of a question that I, I received from uh, one of our members on position size. Um, is there any difference position sizing for a small account versus a large account? And look, for you know, for our purposes in options trading, if, if you're if you've got an account less than fifty thousand dollars, it's a small account. Uh, if it's more than fifty thousand dollars, and or you know, if you're trading a six figure account, we'll we'll call that a large account. And and look, really, there's there's no difference. The only difference is if you're trading a six figure account, um, there will be some stocks that we talk about where if you're taking a two and a half percent, or you know, a five percent position, you're you're going to have to finesse your entry. And what do I mean by that? If, if you're trying to buy, you know, 15 or 20 contracts in something where the open interest is only, you know, 150 contracts, you might find that you've got to do them in lots of three or lots of five and, and, and maybe work that order over a period of time. Uh, and even then, you, you, if, you know, if, if the open interest is only 100 contracts, you don't really want to be buying 20 contracts, really. You, you probably only want to be buying five tops. Um, so you just you'll find that um, the larger your account, the more you're going to skew your trading towards mega cap stocks, uh, or if you are trading smaller stocks, or uh, when I say smaller stocks, I mean less liquid option option stocks. HCA would be a case in point. Um, you, you're just going to have to really kind of wind back your position size, um, but that that would be the the only difference, and it just means in the larger account you're, you're taking less risk in, in terms of percentage of your NLV. Um, I'm happy to pointing out, it uh, looks like there are mixed signals. Bonds show a pullback, but the trend lines show the opposite. How would I proceed? Keep looking for clean setups on the long and short side. Yeah, but but I think above all else, uh, just hold lots of cash. You know, I'm, I'm literally 90% cash at the moment. Um, and I'm I've got a I think I've got one long position and and three short positions on at the moment and yeah my short positions are, are all very kind of gently bearish through cool credit spreads and um, really not not doing a lot at the moment because the the, the muddy the, the waters are muddied and in this sort of an environment when when the waters are muddied it just pays to take less risk risk exposure all right. And that's that's really where I think your your peripheral analysis or your macro analysis or whatever you want to call it um, pays dividends. I'm not a macro trader, okay? I don't I don't take macro setups, um, 
But what I, where I use macro is when, when everything's pointing in the same direction, that is a time to take on more risk, go out and try and hit a few winners, right? When I'm getting mixed signals, when, when equity markets look really bullish, but I'm seeing some pretty serious warning signs in, in bonds and HYG, put call ratio to a lesser extent, the dollar, it, that just tells me I want to be sitting mostly on cash and, and wait for things to clear up. Uh, Phoebe, you're asking, do I advise some hedge positions? No, I don't. All right. Because if you think back to the hedging checklist, we're, we're just not there. The indices aren't extended. All right. Really, you want to hedge when indices are extended and everything looks amazing. When, when we're back at the mean, um, it's not an ideal time to be hedging. You know, if, if you if you wanted to hedge, you should have done, done it already, is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, what I'm really saying is just 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 hold plenty of cash at the moment. Don't be too eager to trade. Don't be too eager to uh, put put your capital at risk um, because things will clear up. All right, either bonds will find a bottom and start rallying, or triple Qs will start selling off, and uh, you know maybe we get the all clear on on some short trades, or, or maybe maybe on the triple Qs, which is this is probably what I'm looking for at this point. Maybe we get a pullback to the 200 day moving average. All right, and and that's that's kind of what the the weakness in bonds is signalling a deeper pullback, perhaps a more complex correction, and maybe that's the, the the dip to buy it rather than this one. But I don't know yet. All right, I think it's really going to depend on what happens with bonds today, and re release of the Fed minutes today um, could could be an important uh, catalyst for that move. Uh, Phoebe. You got another question. Do I suggest wait till we get some clearer signals in bonds or trade the chart? Look, always trade the chart. But what so what I'm really trying to say is trade the chart, but recognize that there are some, in my opinion, pretty major warning signs out there. Yeah, this triple Q chart looks great, but but the chart on bonds sucks. All right. If if you want to be bullish, triple Q. So wind back your risk. Don't be too eager. Um just sit on cash and wait for things to clear up. That that would be my my best advice. Uh, Joseph, you're asking about uh, Silvergate. Trying to put aside my natural bias for that stock. Um, look, I don't have a technical setup here, um, so it's it's really kind of out of my bailiwick, so to speak. Uh, unless there's a counter trend setup looming. That I haven't seen. Yeah, I, I I just don't have a setup there, Joseph. Unfortunately, it's not. I, I've got no reason to buy or sell that one. I mean, I I think I think it's I think it's probably going bankrupt. Uh, but I don't trade my thoughts and opinions. I trade technical setups, and I, I just don't have one at the moment. Oh, you're very welcome, Mo. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You're welcome, Phoebe. Uh, Guru Dev, you're asking, do I use equity futures as well to get a sense of how the markets might move? Look, when I when I chart, I will use if I'm charting SPY, I will use SPY, and I will use ES because I can trade both of them. All right, I can't actually trade SPX because it's just an index. All right, it's just an index of 500 stocks. Um, now ES is kind of the, the, it's sort of like the gold standard because it's the most liquid. Uh, you get far more volume in ES and it trades 24 hours a day. So you see kind of more price action and bigger ranges. So ES is is, is kind of, like I said, I think of it as like the gold standard. Uh, but SPY can be nice because most, well, I know most people in our programs are trading options or stocks. They're not trading futures. So SPY is a bit more relatable. The other thing about SPY, which is nice, is you see the gaps. All right, you see you see the gaps, um, which you don't tend to see on the futures. The only the only time you really see gaps on futures is if there's like a a major kind of Fed announcement or or a gap on the weekend. Uh, otherwise, uh, you, you often don't see the gaps because uh, you know it's trading twenty four hours a day. But yeah, the, the short answer is yes. I I do look at the futures as well. I I, I chart uh, ES and S, SPY and I chart triple Q and uh, NQ. 
So NQ is the, uh, the NASDAQ futures. And they're looking pretty weak today. Okay, they're, they're down a percent. Uh, S&P futures are down almost a percent as well. And if we look at bonds, so bond futures down half a percent. But if 30-year bonds kind of take out this low, and if 10-year uh, notes continue to, get, continue to crunch lower, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be a real headache for stocks uh, over the coming week or two. Uh, you're welcome, Anand. Glad you enjoyed it. Uh, you're welcome, Gurudev. Glad you enjoyed the session. Right, gang. Well, if there are no more questions, I'll uh, I'll let you go. No homework this week. Oh, Joseph, you're looking at UAN. Let's have a look at that one quickly. Never heard of this one. Never traded this ticker. What is it? Um, ah, we got earnings. So just 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 be just be careful. We got earnings today. Uh, so let that let that go past, and then and then maybe have another look at it. Um, yeah, it certainly looks like we've had a, a nice pullback to the mean. Uh, it looks pretty bearish. Certainly wouldn't be surprised if uh, if that um, downtrend continues. Uh, but obviously, just uh, get this earnings announcement out of the way. Yeah, they're announcing today after market. Uh, you're very welcome, Robert. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers, Rudy. Right, I gang. Uh, I'll let you go there. Hope you enjoyed the session. Um, if you got, uh, as always, if you've got any other questions, hit us up on the help desk. And if you've got any questions you'd specifically like me to cover on the next coaching call, uh, yeah, just email them through, uh, preferably, you know, a week or so beforehand. That'd be awesome. Oh, Joseph, CVR is a U.S. fertilizer chemical company. Oh, thanks for that. Good on you, Joseph, and uh, thanks for the feedback. You have a great week too, mate. Righto. Cheers, gang. Catch you next month. Thank you.